One of the things that struck me was um, the symbolism of the, of the lamb, particularly in the holy city of Jerusalem. Uh, three symbols that stood out were, of course, the Star of David, the symbol of Judaism, the Crescent, which is the symbol of, of Islam, the Muslim faith, and then the cross. And as we, if you know anything about the old city of Jerusalem, it's divided into four qu- quarters. There's a Christian quarter, a Muslim quarter, there's an Armenian quarter, and then there's the Jewish quarter. One of the things, every quarter has its own shops and narrow streets, and one of the things that struck me was in every quarter you could buy crosses, even the Muslim and the Jewish quarter. Everywhere you looked, crosses. People crossing themselves, people wearing crosses, crosses for sale, crosses on top of buildings, everywhere you looked. How many of you this morning are wearing a cross somewhere on your person? Show of hands. A few of you are. How many of you have a cross somewhere hanging in your home? Yeah? Some of you may know this about me. I like to collect crosses. I don't know why people make them for me or give them to me or I buy them sometimes at extravagant or, or you know, exotic places like Israel, sometimes at Hobby Lobby. But either way, <laughs> this cross is made of jade. It's from Ecuador. My first trip there, I, I, I always in, it's beautiful to me. And I remember, remember that first trip I took to Ecuador with students as a youth pastor. This cross is uh, one of my favorites as well. It's one that was given to me by my daughter. And um, I don't know where she got it, but it's from, it's from her to me, so I, I appreciate it that way. And this cross I just purchased, made of olive wood in Israel in one of those shops, and so I thought I'd bring it and show you my little cross collection. Why? Today we start a series uh, called The Reach of the Cross. For two weeks, today and of course on Easter Sunday morning, we're going to talk about what the cross is and what, is, what it really means. The cross, as we've mentioned, is ubiquitous in our culture. It's everywhere you look. It's become kind of cool to have a cross tattooed on your body, hanging from your ears or around your neck or on your t-shirt or wherever else. But that, if you, we we don't stop and think about that much as a strange thing, but it is absolutely astounding from first century perspective that the cross should be so common, commonplace in our culture. It's a shocking thing, really. Every religion has its symbol, but the earliest symbol for Christianity was not a cross, some of the earliest ones were there was an anchor, and then some of you know, a fi- how many of you have a fish on your car? A little fish symbol? You have a fish, and then Darwin eating the fish, and then truth fish eating Darwin, and it just goes on and on, right? You have all these little fish wars going on in the back of our cars. <laughs> but the fish, the symbol of a fish, is actually comes, it's not the uh, feeding of the 5,000 or the loaves and fishes. The origin of that symbol was that the, the phrase, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, in Greek, the, the first letter for each of those words, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, in Greek makes the acronym ichthus, which is the Greek word for fish. It was sort of a secret symbol that only the initiated would understand because Christians in the first and second and third centuries uh, were under persecution. How did the cross become the symbol of our faith? First, let's start with what the cross was. As most of you know, the cross was an implement, an instrument in a means of torture and death called crucifixion. That existed in the ancient world for many centuries before the time of Christ. So the Romans did not invent crucifixion, but they certainly perfected it. They used it, and they experimented with it, and they made it almost part of their conquering policy. The point of crucifixion was not simply capital punishment. There are easier ways and quicker ways to kill a person. The point of crucifixion was to send a message to those you were ruling over, those, the territories you occupied to intimidate those who opposed Rome, to keep the people of the lands that were conquered by the Roman legions in place. Keeping the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was rarely a peaceful process. The Jewish historian Josephus Flavus records a number of mass crucifixions, several hundred at a time. Sometimes on on conquered cities that put up a fight, the Roman legions would crucify all the conquered rebels on the roads going into and out of the city. So anyone coming in or out of the city by the main roads would have to pass by hundreds of dying men on crosses. You think you get the message? And sometimes even they would forbid families from taking those bodies down to add humiliation and injury. Just let them decompose up there. So nobody would miss the point. Don't mess with Rome. Here's how it worked. First, there was a flogging or scourging by a flagrum. Sometimes we use the phrase cat of nine tails. It was a wooden handle wrapped in leather with nine long straps off the end of it. Each, the end of each of those straps was either tied a, a hard leather knot or a piece of bone or metal tied into that knot. Some of you might know about this. The point of the little piece of bone or metal or the knot was that when the person was whipped on their bare back with that flagrum, those mo- bone metal knots would dig into the flesh. And when it's pulled off, parts of the flesh would be torn off. If you've seen The Passion of the Christ... You know what I'm talking about. 
39 lashes. The Romans actually experimented with how much a man could take without dying so he could still carry out his sentence. 39 lashes was standard. Next, the prisoner was stripped completely naked for maximum humiliation. Bleeding, torn flesh, naked. They were forced to carry what's called the patibulum. It's the cross beam. It's most likely the, the, the crucified person did not carry the whole cross, just the cross beam. The vertical posts were already there at the place of crucifixion. They were made to carry this, and if they couldn't hold it, their arms were tied to it through the streets. And out the city gate to the place of their execution. Next, a trained group of Roman soldiers, about four to six soldiers, who were on crucifixion detail. This is at times when there were not mass crucifixions going on. Of course, that required more soldiers. But in, 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 in just in general course of life, there were always somebody being crucified. Soldiers would be there. They were in charge to carry out the sentence. There were various forms. Sometimes the person was roped to the cross beam, sometimes nailed, depending on how fast or slow they wanted death to be. You might think nails are worse, perhaps they're more painful in the moment, but you die faster from blood loss than from being roped to the cross beam. Death took hours, certainly hours, sometimes days. The soldiers um, made a kind of sport out of it, almost to protect themselves from the brutality of it, experimenting, tormenting the victims, placing bets on how long they would last, doing unspeakable things to the bodies hanging there even gambling about the outcome. Cause of death was a combination of blood loss, blunt force trauma, heart failure, asphyxiation, any number of things could kill you on the cross, and that was kind of the point. Often the, the Romans would um, use uh, large clubs with a, a knot at the end to break the legs of the victim so they could no longer push it up for air to expedite the process. Sometimes they wouldn't do that. This whole thing was so gruesome, and many of you know about this, but it was so gruesome that Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified. Only the emperor himself could override that to have a Roman citizen crucified. You couldn't crucify a Roman citizen. The Roman historian Cicero writes about this, saying, it's the most barbaric, cruel, and disgusting punishment, and the very mention of it should be far from a Roman citizen's mind or lips. Don't even speak about it. It's so awful. Yet it went on. So how in the world did this gruesome, unspeakably horrible act of torture and death come to be a piece of jewelry hanging around your neck this morning or in my cross collection? How does that happen? How did this repulsive symbol that people in Rome weren't even to speak or think about become a symbol of a religion claimed by millions today? That's the story we're going to look at in this short two-week series. But let's back up a bit and give you a little historical context. Palm Sunday, Jesus comes over the Mount of Olives about 36 hours ago, right, Lorene, or so? I forget. I don't know what time it is exactly right now. Uh, Jesus comes over the Mount of Olives into the Holy City. People come out of the city to greet him waving palm branches like the little kids were doing a moment ago. That's why we call it Palm Sunday. Shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How fast things change in a week, Right? And then somewhere in that week, that, that day, he goes to the temple, he overturns the money changers' tables, and he drives them out with whips, saying, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. He spends the week kind of in and out of the city in that region, teaching, proclaiming the good news, and also talking about his death to come. Somewhere in that week, Judas, one of the twelve, agrees to betray him. There are huge crowds, lots of buzz about the Messiah. There's also tension mounting as well. People wanting to get a piece of Jesus and arrest him and put him to death. Then comes time to prepare for the Passover. He tells his disciples to go into the city and make preparations, and they do. From there, they have the Last Supper, the Passover meal, in the upper room together. After that meal, they go out down through the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane, the bottom of the Mount of Olives, where they spend time in prayer. Then comes the betrayal, the arrest, the trial before Caiaphas, the high priest, Caiaphas sends Jesus, after finding him guilty of heresy, to uh, Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect, because though Jewish authorities could pronounce a death sentence, they had no authority to carry it out. They needed Rome to do that. Pilate says, I find no fault with this man, but basically, in order to give in to the pressure, he agrees to have this, this would-be ra rabbi from Nazareth crucified. Has him flogged and scourged and says, fine. We'll crucify him. Now, this is getting close to the Sabbath. We've been there on the, on the Sabbath time. They have to expedite the process. The whole thing happens relatively fast from this point. Let's pick up the story in Luke 23. 
verses 32 through 43. This is just the account of his death here. Luke 23, verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. One of the things we see in every single one of the gospel accounts of Jesus' crucifixion is that he was reviled, taunted, and mocked. The cross reaches out to those who mock. In every single account, we have the account of Jesus being mocked by multiple groups of people. What does it mean to be mocked? Teased? ridiculed, made to look the fool. I remember when I was in college playing football for Wheaton College and we had lost a very tough game. I was a freshman on the team and brand new and we were, had just lost our second game of the year in a, in a tough game. I won't tell you what school it was that beat us. But we were gathering together and our coach was leading us in a prayer before we uh, went to change and get on the bus to head home. And some, some students from the opposite team, the uh, university, were walking by on kind of a hill above us. The, the, the stadium had, was built on a hillside. And I, we're about, I had our heads bowed. I remember this one guy, I could hear this voice of this one student. They were kind of mocking us and teasing. And one yelled out, oh God, please forgive us for being so, such a terrible, he didn't use the word terrible team, and help us not to suck so bad. I wanted to wake up out of that prayer, run up the hill and strangle that guy in the name of Christ, of course. <laughs> I'm so angry. I felt so enraged. You know? No one likes to be mocked. Luke tells us that Jesus was mocked by at least three different groups. First, in verse 35, the people stood watching, and even the rulers sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. Now, I want you to notice that, that phrase. He saved others. Let him save himself. That phrase, let him save himself, comes up over and over again in the mocking words of these three different groups. So he was mocked not only by the crowds, but by the rulers, that is, the religious leaders, the teachers, those who were supposed to be spiritual guides of God's people, were the forefront of those mocking him. Earlier in the account, we find out they blindfold him, strike him, and say, prophesy, prophet, who hit you? They taunted him as they handed him over to the Roman authorities. Luke continues, the soldiers also came up in verse 36 and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Same line again. He was mocked by not only Jewish religious authorities, but by pagan Roman soldiers who seemed to be making a sport of the whole thing. Think about it. He was being mocked as the king of the Jews. These Roman soldiers understood authority and power. They knew what a king looked like, and it was not this guy, this half-dead, pitiful, naked figure. That's why they make a purple robe and a crown of thorns. The whole thing's a big joke to them. Let's cram it on his head. Let's place that robe over his ripped and bleeding back so the fabric will stick to his flesh. It's a joke. It's just a big joke. This king, I know what a king looks like, and it's not that. John tells us the soldiers went as far as to put this crown of thorns on him, a robe around his shoulders, a staff in his hands. They fell on their knees even and pretended to worship him. As I mentioned, we got back from Israel yesterday. One of the many things that I learned there had to do with Roman soldiers mocking Jesus the way that this account describes. We were visiting the ruins of a city called Scythopolis. It's uh, one of the, it's, uh, it's one of the uh, ten cities of the Decapolis. And there's, they had uncovered, it's, it's a remarkable archaeological dig. They had uncovered the ruins, the ancient ruins, even the steps of a 9,000-seat open-air theater. Right next to it was a public bath and even a public toilet. And you'll see a picture here of Pastor Brian and I relieving ourselves. Not really, but anyway. <laughs> Against this ancient wall, like, dating back to the first century B.C., first century A.D., you would sit on these stones and there was a, uh, water flowing underneath. 
Uh, our guide told us that in previous groups, somebody asked the questions, how do people in the ancient world, what do they use for toilet paper? It's a weird thing to want to know, but they asked the question. And the guy said, we know, have accounts that many Roman soldiers and Roman citizens carried with them like a personal sponge for that purpose, for personal cleanliness. Now think about that for a minute. When Jesus says in John 19, I thirst, and they place a sponge on the end of a stick, and they soak it in wine and vinegar, and they raise it up to him. I always thought of that as a, a little act of kindness. I think it's a way of mocking him. How, bad, how thirsty are you? You want to drink from this? How bad do you want to drink? He's suffering for the world, and all the time he's being ridiculed, reviled, mocked. In verse John 19, verse 29, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the Scriptures, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth, the ultimate insult. He was even mocked not only by the crowds, the religious leaders, and the pagan Roman soldiers, he was also mocked by those, one of those being crucified right next to him. Luke writes in verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. You see that every time they mock him? If you're really the real deal, do something about it. Prove it. Come off the cross. Save yourself. That's the ultimate taunt. Here's the beautiful irony which we're going to come to in a few moments. In order to save the world, he must not save himself. He is saving others by not coming off the cross. It's hard to fathom the humiliation. Pastor Brian and I were talking about this in the airport waiting for our next flight. This is Jesus, the one about whom Paul wrote, all things hold together by word of his power. This is the eternal word made flesh, John tells us in his gospel. This is Jesus who healed the blind and raised the dead and made the lame walk. This is Jesus who fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. This is Jesus who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Being mocked. A perfect man. The only way he could save them was by enduring it and not saving himself. How do we mock today? It's easy, I think, to miss this and think, well, that's not me. I'm not mocking Jesus. I mean, I may not be a perfect person, but I'm not mocking him. Don't be so sure. I think, I was thinking about this even on the, on the flight over here. I had a lot of time on that flight. Anytime we make him out to be less than he is in our lives, it's a form of mockery. He's the God of heaven, the high king of heaven, the creator of the universe, the Lord of all creation. Anytime we diminish him in our lives, it's a kind of mockery. It's a kind of, yeah, you don't deserve that. You know, the song we sing, we'll sing here in a few moments and certainly in a few days at Holy Week Communion, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. Do you hear your own voice? Can you acknowledge that you too are among the mockers? How did Jesus respond to those who mocked him? He prayed for those who mocked him, he forgave those who spit on him, and he loved those who hated him. And in so doing, he fulfilled what the prophet Isaiah wrote 700 years before. In Isaiah 53, verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Didn't say a word. Just took it all. The cross reaches out to those who mock, and it reaches out with forgiveness. Luke tells us when they came to the place called the skull, what does this mean? It means Golgotha, the Aramaic word for the place of the skull. Scholars disagree about whether that meant the skull was, the hill was shaped like a skull, skull-shaped hill, or whether it was because there were skulls on the hill. Either way, it's the place of crucifixion. They crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. You hear that? It's so easy to miss. It's just a simple little line. Take him to be executed, one on his right, one on his left, and he utters this little phrase. And that little phrase tells you everything you need to know about the nature of the gospel, the essence of what it means to be a Christian, what we're all about here as a church. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. In the text and in your life and in spiritual reality, forgiveness always comes before anyone's asked for it or deserves it or earns it. It always comes first. Jesus forgives those responsible, forgives those mocking, forgives those that are putting him to death. And not one of them has yet said, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? 
He does not wait or require that those who have mocked him, beaten him, nailed him to the cross unjustly apologize or seek forgiveness. He offers it first. What kind of forgiveness is that? Most of us, I think, think it works the other way around. Sure, we should be forgiving. Sure, we shouldn't hold grudges. But that person has to be sorry for what they did. How can you forgive somebody who isn't sorry for what they did? How does that work? How can you forgive somebody who doesn't even think they need forgiveness? That is, that's not forgiveness. But apparently, in God's economy, that's exactly what forgiveness is. I'm gonna, um, I didn't ask him ahead of time, but Rusty, would you help me with something? Would you come up here? <laughs> I know Rusty will have to ask him. He's like, oh man, I should have sat in the front row. I've done, used this analogy and illustration at other times, and, um, and I think it'll be helpful. Some of you may remember it. Rusty's a friend of mine. He, he, there's no problem between us, but just for the sake of argument, let's pretend we have an issue. And I'm angry with something Rusty said or did to me. And this cross represents the wound, my issue with Rusty, right? So most of us think forgiveness works like this. You hold on to this, don't let go until I tell you. I'll forgive you, Rusty, if you seem sorry enough. If you've suffered the way I've suffered. If I think you really mean it, right? If enough time's gone by, if I made you pay for it, right? And we play this little emotional tug of war, and he's not forgiven, and I'm not forgiving, and nobody's free. Make sense? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Thanks, you can let go now. <laughs> hold on, hold on. But forgiveness works this way, according to God. I forgive you. I'm not carrying that anymore. I'm not defining you by what you did. I forgive you. Now, Rusty may never pick that up. He may never say, Jeff, I'm sorry. I want to be friends again and, and receive that forgiveness. That's called reconciliation. They're different things. But I don't have to carry it, right? I don't have to carry his sin for him. And again, we have no issue. Rusty and I are good friends. So thank you. Let's, say, let's thank Rusty for this. <laughs> In the gospel, it works like that. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They haven't asked for it. They don't deserve it. They haven't earned it. That's the point of forgiveness. It's never deserved. It's never earned. It's always given. But here's the other point. It's not free. It's free to the one who receives it. But it is always costly. Forgiveness is never deserved, never earned. But it's always costly. In that case, relate humanly speaking, when you, when, when you have anger and resentment and bitterness and pain and hurt and a ball of it in your heart and you can't forgive somebody and then you finally decide to release them, who, what do you do with that stuff? You don't put it on them. You absorb it and you ask God to heal you. There's a cost. Forgiveness is free to us but not to the one who offers it to us. That's what the point of the cross is. The cost of it. Some of you have not experienced this free grace offered to you at great cost by a loving God. Some of you have, but you haven't found a way to offer it to somebody else who's hurt you. That's what the cross means. It reaches out to those who mock, who are undeserving with forgiveness. Third, the cross reaches out to those who are broken. As a pastor, Pastor Brian and I talked about this. Uh, we're convinced that there are far more deathbed conversions than many of us will ever know. I've had the privilege and responsibility of being with people at the end of their earthly life. Most of us live uh, our lives pretending we'll live forever, but it's simply too emotionally difficult to face our mortality. The fact that we'll all die someday. When the time comes when a person can no longer pretend, when it's right in front of them, when they can't hide from it, and the prognosis is not good, their family gathers around their bed, there's often a kind of spiritual desperation in that moment. I've seen people in moments like that. A person in that condition longs for answers to questions like, has my life made a difference? Am I, am I ready? Am I prepared for whatever comes next? Will God accept me? Luke tells us that for one of the criminals, that's exactly the place where he was. No pretending, no hiding. He knows he will not live out the next several hours. It is the end for him, physically speaking. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him and said, Don't you fear God? He said, Since you are under the same sentence, but we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Those two guys hanging there give us a perfect case study. They're in the same condition, spiritually speaking, physically speaking. 
They're dying in the, exact, in the same spot by the same means next to the same man. One of them misses it completely. The other one is broken enough to see it. Notice, one prays, get me out of this. I think everyone on the planet, even atheists at one time or another, have said, God, if you're there, just get me out of this, and I'll do whatever, right? How many of you have prayed some form of that prayer in your life? God, if you'll just help me with this, I'll, I'll trust you, I'll believe you, I'll clean up my act, I'll do whatever, right? That's essentially what the first criminal says. If you, save yourself and us and me is what he means. The other one says, Nothing at all about his present circumstances. He says, I deserve this. He does not ask Jesus to get him off the cross. You notice that? He does not ask Jesus to save him from his present pain. He says, remember me. Just remember me. The contrast between these two men is striking, and I think it illust illustrates something for us. An utterly broken man, dying, and he knows he deserves it. No pretending. Things aren't as bad as they are. Just a man face to face with the remnants of a wasted life and turning to the only one he can turn to, the one next to him, and saying, remember me. In other words, a man in exactly the position, the perfect position to receive the forgiveness and grace that Jesus offers. He has nowhere else to turn. No flowery confession, no theological prayer explanation, just the, the, the desperate cry of a dying person. If you feel like you can't really relate to this man's condition, I tell you, you're wrong. You're blind. We are all dying men and women, spiritually and physically. And we all have only one person we can turn to for hope. Though our world is full of people turning in all kinds of directions, crying out in all kinds of wrong places. Spiritually speaking, we're just like that guy. If we can only see it. One of the things that's been impressed on me since coming back, and Lorraine and I were just talking, it's, it's hard to process all that we uh, saw over there. But coming back, I, I realized that in our culture, there's so much in the way of me and of you seeing my true condition. So much that fools into thinking that we're okay when we're not. And this man on the cross is meant to show us we're all like that, eventually. Maybe not in the same, maybe not condemned as an earthly criminal, maybe not dying in that kind of physical pain, but spiritually speaking, we're coming to the end and we have only one person to turn to. All he knows is, in an honest acknowledgement of his condition, I deserve this. We sometimes refer to these guys as thieves, and uh, th burglary or stealing was not a capital offense. It didn't deserve crucifixion. Uh, so clearly, if these guys were thieves, thieves is more of a traditional term, whoever the, whatever these guys did, if it was involved stealing, it also involved shedding blood, murder. These were not good guys. These were bad guys. He says, I deserve this. These are not Jewish rebels who Rome's being mean to. These two guys, he says, we're getting what we deserve but not him. He recognizes it. He sees it. Earlier in the text, there's this passage where Jesus is carrying his cross and these women are weeping for him. He says, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves and your children. That's a weird thing to say. What does he mean? You ever turn on the TV and see a newscast of some uh, atrocity, some part of the world? Often involves women wailing and weeping, Right? over a child slain innocently in a drive-by or in a bombing or something, or some horrible thing, and you see the women, that's a news shot, right, of a mother or, or some women just crying out over some horrific scene. Sometimes we're callous and we just flip on by the next thing, but every now and then it causes me to weep. But I'm always weeping for them. I'm not weeping for me. I'm not part of it. Jesus says, I'm not like that. I'm not like some tragedy you see on TV that makes you sad for a moment. I'm not just another innocent person suffering. The point of the cross is that you weep for yourselves and you, the fact that you put me there, that it's your sin. Remember the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. It was my sin that held him there. That's what it means to be broken. Finally, the cross reaches out with hope. To those who mock and are undeserving, which is all of us if we're honest, the cross reaches out with forgiveness first. Some may never pick that up and be reconciled to him. Those of us who are broken enough to see our own condition and our own need, the cross reaches out with hope. 
Jesus answers the, the man, truly I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Now we don't have time to unpack all that's meant in that amazing little phrase. But he answers him with hope. Remember me, Jesus says, I'll do better than that. You'll be with me in paradise. It's the promise of eternal life, the promise of the hope of heaven. That's why the cross is, is, means what it means today. That's why the cross reaches out with forgiveness and hope. It's not just a piece of jewelry or an interesting symbol or a cool thing to have tattooed on your arm. I hope none of us ever look at the cross the same way again. This week and the rest of our lives, every time we see one, we remember. We're brought face to face with the reality of who we are and the reality of who he is and what he did for us. That's what the cross means. I've shared this story before, but about three or four years ago, I had the chance to go to Angola Prison in Louisiana. It's the largest state penitentiary in our country. And the average sentence there is about 80 years. Most of the guys there are never going to get out. I met a man named Eldon who's um, on death row. He went there for a triple homicide he committed when he was 21 years old in a gang-related incident in New Orleans. And he's, um, when I met him, he was 21 when we went in. When I met him, he was in his 50s. So he's had appeals and been waiting there for a long time. He knows he's not getting out. He knows he will die either by natural causes or by lethal injection in that prison. And he's deeply in love with Jesus Christ. It's hard to reconcile. You know, never mind. A man getting what he deserves, according to the law of the state of Louisiana, and most of us would agree. We don't have to debate capital punishment, but he's, he's, not, he's not been a good guy. And yet he told me his story. And I'll never forget, through his cell door, he pointed out the window to the razor wire around the compound. He says, I had to come in here to realize that that's not the line. That's not what separates being free and being in prison. He pointed to the razor wire. And then he turned and pointed to a little cross hanging on his wall above his bed. He said, that is. That's not what separates a free person from an imprisoned person. That is. <laughs> that guy's freer than I am in some ways. Freer than many of us. Friends, this is the cross that we wear, that we hang up, we put above our churches and on our, the walls of our home, and the cross of Christ. Only God could take a symbol of torture and brutality and death and suffering and make it the symbol of everlasting hope. Only our God can do that. I hope we never see the cross the same way again. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you for all that you've done for us and in us and through us. And we worship you for the cross. We do not worship the cross, Lord. We worship you because of it. That you suffered and died in our place. You endured not just the physical agony, but the spiritual pain of being cut off so that we might be brought in. Oh God, lift our eyes to you. For those who do not know your forgiveness and love on the cross, might they come to see it and experience it in a powerful way. For those of us who know that you've forgiven us, but we have a hard time extending that to others, Lord, break our hearts. Help us to see that we have no right to withhold forgiveness when we come face to face with all that you have already forgiven to us. We praise you, Jesus, and we thank you in your name. Amen.